I think purpose finds us. I have a belief that we already have like a blueprint inside of us and our purpose, our mission, what we're here for is encoded. It's not something we have to go find It's in us. I think it's actually around the deconditioning and the unlayering and through that process, we find our purpose. Hey, I'm Brooke Jean, therapist, recovering perfectionist and struggling working mom on a mission to normalize normal. If you're an overwhelmed, high-achieving, and secretly anxious mama struggling to balance it all and on the brink of burnout, you are in the right place. Here is where we talk about hard things like balancing work and family life, mental health, and how to navigate life-altering transitions. Nothing is too taboo here. In my conversations, I'll teach you how to let go of who you think you're supposed to be in order to create the life you've always wanted. Get ready to embrace your messy, shed the shoulds, and find freedom through a life unperfected. This is the Unperfected Pod. Hello, 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 everybody. Brooke Jean here, your host of the Unperfected Pod. And I am so excited about the interview for this week's episode. A friend, a newfound friend, and what I believe is a soul sister that I've recently connected with in my podcast mastermind, Miss Christine Bano is on the show this week, and she is the host of the Holy Fuck Moments podcast. She is an intuitive life transformation coach, and she is also a busy, high-achieving, anxious AF working mama just like us. And this interview is so beautiful because she so honestly and vulnerably shares her story of being married to someone who has an addiction and turning her pain into purpose and getting sick because she was in the wrong spaces and places. She talks about her journey to healing and to figuring out what her mission is in this world and how COVID and going through a divorce kickstarted her goosebump worthy healing journey. And so there is a little bit of everything in her story. And what I love so much about her in this conversation is how she just kept believing in herself and figuring things out as she went and opening up and healing and getting to know deeper parts of who she is. And that is how she connected to her soul's purpose. And she is just doing beautiful things and beautiful work in the world. So I'm very excited for you guys to hear her share her holy fuck moments and how they changed the trajectory of her life. I want to let you guys know, you probably already know this by now, but this podcast is not for kids. So if you have kiddos in the car, you might not want to press play because we drop the F bombs. We talk about really raw and hard things. And so this one isn't for the little loves. Make sure they're not present, but this one is most definitely for you. Welcome back to the Unperfected Pod, where we normalize normal and find freedom through a life unperfected. What is up, mamas? I am so excited to be here with you today, and I am bringing a new found friend and, dare I say, soul sister that I've connected with in a podcasting mastermind. I have a special guest. Her name is Christine Bano. She is the host of the Holy Fuck Moments podcast. She is a personal transformation coach, and she is just a firecracker queen who energetically I was immediately drawn to. She is going through pretty much every single life transition you can imagine, and I just know we're going to have such a juicy conversation about all things pivoting and finding purpose and finding magic in your motherfucking mess and all the good things. But Christine, thank you so much for being here, my love. I'm so excited to jump into this conversation with you. I am so excited. I'm so excited to be here. I can like already feel your audience. I feel like you have like the most badass women who listen to this podcast. Like I could just like feel the vibe already. I'm so excited to be here and I can't wait to just dish all the dirt, all the juicy (laughs) stuff. Like, let's just go. Let's fucking go. Let's do it. I know we do. I have like, I mean, the audience is the listeners are me and you, right? They're like driven working moms who are doing the damn thing and also doing it messy and trying to give themselves a little grace along the way. But let's start with your story. Okay. So 
I mean, it's such an interesting question because whenever I'm like, tell me your story, people know I'm a therapist. So they're like, do you want me to start at like age two? And we're like, <laughs> like yes, I do. But let's start with today. Who are you? What do you do? And then also, I want to know how many kids you have and their ages, just to give the listeners a little bit of context before we jump in. Amazing. Okay. Whenever people ask me, like, what do I do? I'm like, well, it depends what month it is. And also, like, it just, you know what I mean? Like, the transformation and the way it changes and the wording just slightly. So it's evolving, right? You're like getting, you're getting closer and closer to it. You're redefining and refining what your soul's calling is and the stuff, like the juiciest part of the work. So I think that's more than normal. We need to normalize that. Totally. Okay. So I've, I'm a mom. I've got two little kids. I'll start with that. So I have Eva, Eva, who is six years old. She's just out the door going into grade one. And she's a little firecracker herself. I must tell you, it's like one of those things where I just love the sass, but also it's so fucking hard to parent sometimes where I'm like, I just want you to stop. But I also don't like I've done enough work to know like, but I also don't want you to stop because I want you to be a powerful, independent, like firecracker woman. So like, ugh, I so want to use your voice. You. Yes, I exactly. Know. But those are yeah. hard. I mean, same girl, my six year old, she is a Leo. She's the boss of the family and she's intense. And she never stops talking. And I find myself thinking in my head, dude, be quiet, but I don't want to say it out loud because similar to you, I want to let that flourish, but it's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot energetically. And it also can be straight up triggering at times. Oh, uh, the amount of work I've had to do, I know we're still in the intro, but the amount of work I've had to do around when Eva was younger and she would, you know, be super loud and have meltdowns. And before I had really, really like reclaimed the part of me who hadn't done that as a child and had to suppress and had to be a good girl and a people pleaser. Her meltdowns were so triggering. Like I literally was like, just stop. Like I couldn't handle it because I had so much of that in myself that was so suppressed. And so her mirroring that back to me of my, like my suppressed rage and big emotions and frustration that I couldn't feel as a child. Anyways, that's a whole nother topic, but like, it was so fascinating to do that work. And now I have so much more tolerance to, allow her to be exactly who she is and not make it bad or wrong or whatever. So anyways, so that's Eva, so she's six, firecracker. And then I have my littlest Mia, who is 18 months. So she is just a little wee one. Yeah, so she's 18 months. Again, super just like fiery in her own way. Not so much like vocal yet, but like very, like if her sister comes at her, she will like smack her right in the face. She's like, no. I'm like, damn girl, your boundaries are on. They are lit. They are better than mine sometimes. Like she is cut. She's not taking it. She's holding her own. She's yeah, exactly. So those are my kids. So right now in the world, I am in, like you said, major transition. I would call myself a entrepreneur, a creative. So on my Instagram bio right now, it says I am a psychic business coach and a personal transformation specialist. I mean, that could change in like literally a week. So by the time this airs, who knows what it'll be. So I just actually sold a fitness studio, my fitness studio that I had for eight years. So I was a brick and mortar business owner. I started that in 2016. COVID was obviously a fucking nightmare for that. We went through all sorts of ups and downs with that, but I sold the business in the summer because I really wanted to go all in on my coaching business and the podcast. And so right now I'd call myself a podcast host and I am like a radical transformation catalyst. If you're like, it's, I work with women who are like just on that edge of change. A lot of them are like female CEOs or founders or leaders who are like found a lot of success in the traditional sense, like have the money, have a marriage, have like, you know, the house, the car, the they have everything that they've been told job. that they should bring in them fulfillment. And they're either wanting to transition into like more soul work or bring sort of more of that sort of intuition and soul into their businesses. Or sometimes they want to completely change businesses or they want to like they're ready to up level what they've created. It's sort of like they've hit a glass ceiling based on who they've been and their personality. And so if they're ready to like really go into that inner mastery game and like understand that their business is also a reflection of them and their limitations and all these things. So when I come in and I work with people, I always say to people, I'm like, unless you're ready, like to get a fire lit right under your ass, I will love you and I will support you. And I've like, I've done tons of trauma work and all that. I'm not going to like traumatize you, but I can do that loving work with people. But like people move really, really fucking fast in my world. When we work together, I'm like, unless you're ready, like if you're ready to do the work, let's go. But if not, 
I'm not the right coach for you. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. So they're on the brink of a big change in their life and you are the doula to help them step into that big change and create and co-create that reality. And I I can tell you're that like, tell it like it is like me. This is why I think we like each other. Nothing's going to go unsaid, honey. If we see it, if we feel it, we're going to share it with you and we're going to push you to your limit. We're going to see that potential in you and we're going to help you get there. It's beautiful. And that transformation piece, right? Like I can tell that's the part of your work that really lights your soul on fire. But I want to dive into that because So many people ask, like, how do I know what my soul's work is? Like, let's say I've been doing the corporate daddy game or how do I know what my purpose is? How did you come into contact with what your soul's purpose is? You said that you just sold a business. What led up to that decision and how did you know it's time for me to become a coach? I love it. Okay. So we'll go on a bit of a story here. So I believe that my belief is that like soul purpose like shifts and transforms throughout life. So I kind of see it like my purpose eight years ago was being a business was like, that was like the stepping stone for me to get to where I am now. If somebody were to ask, how do I find my soul purpose? I mean, I work with a lot of people, you know, I've done master classes and things on that, which I really like where it's like uncovering your craft questions. Like, like if anyone was listening and they're like, I don't know what my purpose is. I always just say like, what do you love? Like what lights you up? Where do you lose time? Like doing things like what's another question? Oh, like if you had everything you needed, you've got money, you've got like, there's no money isn't even a thing anymore. Like you all, you just have everything you need. Wave a magic wand. You've got it. What are you still doing? Right? Like for me, I think about that. Like if, if I had everything I needed, money wasn't a thing and you took that out of the equation, what would I still be doing? I'd still be talking to people. I love hearing people's stories. I love coaching people. I love helping people. Like I do it on my spare, like I do it on my spare time. I've been doing it my whole entire life. You know what I mean? Like it's just- Come to you for that, right? Like that's another thing. What if people always come to you for? Is it to make them laugh? Is it for advice? Is it for a listening ear? Is it for a kick in the shins? What is it that people come to you for? Yeah. Totally. That, and that's my whole life. People have come to me for with problems. They've come with me, you know, looking for that. They've come for me for motivation, like the amount of people where, you know, even a friend or whoever, I'll be talking to them. And I just have this weird, this like sort of skill or the superpower where I can see people's highest potential. Now that is a blessing and a curse <laughs> when it comes to relationships. But when I'm with somebody, it's like I tap into their energy and I can feel their highest potential. So I almost get this like complete download and vision of where I can see them going, but I can also see the blocks in the way. So it's really fascinating. It's like I can feel like the inner child in them or I can feel the thing that's sort of blocking them from there. So when it comes to people, like they'll come and they'll be super excited about something or they'll feel like a bag of shit and they'll just need some uplifting. And I find that like within seconds, I mean, the emojis, the gifts I send, like I try to keep things really lighthearted. So I feel like people have come to me when they're maybe needing that like zing of energy. It's almost like a little lightning bolt. But the, my journey to purpose was not linear. I mean, I started, I grew up very lost with who I was, very codependent, extremely chameleon, if you will, like super, very little sense of self. How Do you have siblings? I do. I've got two. So I've got okay. a brother and a sister. Yeah. And the youngest. What is your birth order? Sister is the oldest. She's six years older. And then brother is four years older, I believe. And then I'm the youngest and the baby. You're the baby. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's interesting because I remember like I was working with a counselor one time or a therapist and she said like, who's the addict in your family? Because I had this trajectory of dating addicts my whole life and like men with very high sort of chaotic or narcissistic sort of personalities, like very sort of like intense personalities, which I loved because it kept me very busy. (laughs) get me out of like on oh, my own work but I remember them saying like so who's the alcoholic or who's the addict in your family and I was like nobody and they were like what and they're like let's talk about your childhood I was like oh no 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 this isn't about me like my childhood was totally fine like totally you know hadn't done know. anything yeah so I grew up very little sense of self I got engaged when I was 19 to a guy was living out in Abbotsford in the valley like just wanted to sort of like stay at home and be a mom. And like, I just didn't know my, I had no idea who I was. And so I ended up leaving the relationship. He cheated. And so I ended up leaving the relationship. I went to school for massage therapy. I did like a year of it, decided that I wanted to go party in Vegas. So I'd like ditched that after a year and went to Vegas quarterly for like seven years. 
like when just like party basically and then that's what we do there this is what we do do. that happens it's so interesting totally but it's so interesting looking back because I was just so seeking validation like I would go and feel so amazing when I was there and then I came back and felt like garbage right so anyways so I did that and then I came back and did the makeup like I was serving in and out of restaurants I went and did a makeup program at Blanche McDonald and so I was I thought I wanted to get into tv and film and then I did that and I realized like, well, if I want to be a mom one day, I don't really want to be working like 16 hour days and super long on set. And so I ended up leaving that. And so did you always know yeah. that you wanted to be a mom? Yes. I felt like I always wanted to be a mom. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I felt like that was something that was always, I wouldn't say it was like a very, I always knew I wanted to be a mom, but it wasn't, I think deep inside me, I always knew I wanted to do something bigger, like not bigger than being a mom, but I always knew I wanted to do something as well as being a mom. Like, I feel like that was always kind of purpose beyond being a yeah. mom. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. okay to say that and own yeah. that, you know? No, I just, the way I said it, I'm like, I wanted something bigger than being a mom, yes. but not just counting being a mom, but anyway. Just a small job of being a mom. <laughs> yeah. Just a tiny little job of being a mom. So anyways, I felt really lost. And at the time I was dating my now ex-husband, I guess I should say. <laughs> whatever we'll get into that we'll get into that so anyways I was with him and I felt I just felt so small like it was just a representation like I was like what am I doing with my life why am I you know late 20s and I can't figure out what the hell I'm doing I keep bouncing around I worked at a travel center and sales I worked in you know like all over the place and then I got hired I was like okay I need a big girl job I'm embarrassed I need like a big girl job so I went and got a job at an engineering recruitment like in sales and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. knew nothing about engineering. Like it was wow. just like synchronicity. This lady was like, Oh, you, you know, you, you're, you seem like you'd be great at sales. Anyways, I worked there for like three years. I was fucking miserable. It sounds miserable. <laughs> I was so like, because before that I was almost just like, well, what do I like? I'm going to try that. Okay. I like traveling. Okay. never mind. I don't want to sell travel. Okay. I like makeup. Okay. No, I actually don't want to do makeup. Oh, I like, I like getting massages. Oh, I actually don't like massaging. People. So it was like, I was trying out all these things. You have to figure out what you don't like to figure out what you do. And let's normalize kissing a lot of frogs before you find your prince. There's nothing wrong totally. with that. You know, like totally. it's totally. all part of your journey to get where you're going. So I love hearing how many, I love that you are just willing to go for all these things. I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to learn this and go for it. Yeah. But along the way, there was definitely, I think, a story being built around why can't I just be normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like at that time, I wasn't really honoring those creative urges and didn't understand. You know what I mean? I was just sort of more judging myself based on societal standards. I was like, oh, well, at this point, at 30, I should have already been in a job for 10 years and I should be climbing the corporate ladder. And, <clears throat> excuse There's me. There's the shoulds. I should. There's the shoulds, right? I should. should be quote unquote normal. And yeah. Well, like, it's even normal, right? And at this point, did you have any awareness that you were intuitive or were you disconnected from your intuition at this point? I was totally disconnected from my intuition. No mm-hmm. intuition. In fact, growing up, my mom was really spiritual. Yeah. Brooke, I fucking hated it. Really? I was like, oh, I was like, oh, God, why can't she just be normal? Like, oh, why is she meditating? Oh, God. And she did like hands on healing before it was cool. Like she was like way before the curve. Yeah. She's a manifester in human design. Shocker. But she was like, so she was doing like all the stuff before it was normal. Like, she had me at home like in and it, when it was illegal, like she was always kind of pushing that. But I didn't understand it. And because I felt so much, I think, in fight or flight as a kid, I just wanted to belong and I just wanted to be normal. So I didn't want my parents to be kind of cool and hippie-ish. I didn't want to not have money. I didn't want, you know what I mean? Like it was sort of like I just so desperately wanted to fit in. We moved around a lot as a kid as well. And so I think not having a like a landing pad, you know, like having a lot of movement around and a lot of chaos and stuff like that. I, I think that I just wanted, I think, something to be secure. Yeah. So anyways, I got this job in engineering recruitment. And during that time, that whole entire time since I was a kid, I had a very volatile relationship with food. So like I gained and lost weight a lot. I was overweight as a kid that led to like bullying and teasing and all that stuff. And so mm-hmm. for me, I use exercise as a punishment. It wasn't like, oh, I want to, you know, like now I feel like my relationship is incredible with exercise. Where I'm like, I'm doing it because I want to be strong for my kids. I do it because I want to be healthy. Before it was like, I need to be skinny so I can be loved. Like I need to be fit. You know, I need, so it wasn't about feeling healthy. It was about being skinny 
And so I would go on, I would exercise and then I would, so this is kind of all during this career, this like volatility in career, I would like exercise really hard and then do nothing. It was like black and white. It was just, I'm all in or I'm all out. I'm either eating egg whites and grapefruit, you know, and working out for three hours a day or I'm doing nothing. And that would often intertwine with Vegas when I was going to Vegas and when I was not going to Vegas. So anyways, there was a lot of like diet pills and just all sorts of stuff. And so when I was in this engineering job and I started working out again, cause I got engaged to my now husband and I was like, okay, well I need to be skinny for the wedding. Okay. I need to go and like work out again. So anyways, I found this, I found TRX, this exercise equipment. And I was like at this studio and I was like, oh, I actually kind of like this. Like I started working out again and I liked it. I mean, the motivating driver was to be skinny, of course, for the wedding and look good, but I started working out in unison while working at this job. And one day, again, universal sort of divine intervention, I was like working out there and I got to become a regular. And one of the girls was like, well, have you ever thought about teaching group fitness? And I was like, are you fucking out of your mind? I was like, no, that sounds like my worst nightmare. Number one, public speaking, because like bullying trauma and like being seen. Yeah. Number two, like thinking I don't imposter syndrome. I don't know how to teach. I'm not like a kinesiologist. I don't have like background in that. And she was like, I think you'd be really good. And so she's like, I think you should just sign up for the course and just try it out. And I was like, I don't know. And my mom's like, you should just do it. And I was like, whatever, like no expectation. I did the course. I got an email like two days later and it was like, welcome to the team at this fitness studio. And I was like, oh no, no, I didn't actually like apply. Yeah. <laughs> I would take the course. I didn't say I'm ready. To sign yeah, up. I didn't say. And this girl, it, again, it was literally like there was no choice. So the universe like orchestrated this whole thing. I went into this girl's wing. She mentored me and I became a group fitness instructor. Okay. And I actually ended up falling in love with it. I fell in love with it. It was terrifying. And I literally wanted to barf many times while I was doing the training because it was bringing yeah. it so much about being seen, right? And just being heard and all that stuff. So in unison, this job, I ended up I went on my honeymoon and that's a whole nother story. We went to like Amsterdam red light district and like Ibiza and all the crazy, crazy ass shit. Yeah. But then one day I came back and I, my partner called me and he's like, what are you doing right now? And I was like, I'm stapling bubble wrap. And he's like, you're stapling bubble wrap. I'm like, oh, casual. You're not, you're like, uh-huh. Yeah. I'm like, I'm stapling bubble wrap. He's like, you need to quit your job. And I was like, I'm literally, you know, bubble wrap that you like to press. No, no. I was. This is still the recruiting firm. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. I'm sitting okay. at my desk in my nine to five stapling, stapling bubble, wrap. bubble wrap. I started actually getting sick during that time too. My body started really like it was getting angry. It was like, my soul was like, you are not meant for this. You are not designed for this. You are not built for this. So my health started declining. I actually mm-hmm. went to the doctor one day and she's like, this is cancer. This is healthy. She's like, you're right here. Like it's not looking oh, good. Yeah. You need to go and get a col-. So anyways, they clip okay. like part of your insides basically out, not comfortable. So they were monitoring me, but my mom, super intuitive, and she said to me one time, I remember I was just like super scared, obviously. My life was felt like it was all over the place. And she's like, Christine, this is just, imagine this is just like a snapshot. So this is just like, if the unit, if you're just like taking a picture, this is just a representation of your life right now. This can change. Like it can be, you know what I mean? It can be different like tomorrow. So anyways, it was really helpful. I quit the job. I started working at the studio full time it completely disappeared. Any sign of cancer, like it was gone. So it was like, just from changing your job, changing my job. Yeah. This is such an example of how our environment affects our health and well being. A thousand percent. Like a thousand percent. And I think when you're stuck in something, when I look back to that version of me, there there was this feeling of like stuck, you know what I mean? Like I can't Mm -hmm. get out of this because I'm here in this job and you know, I'm making okay money. It's not great, but it's fine. It's enough. And I have this like a respectable quote unquote job. And so I felt stuck. Like I felt like, oh, I don't really have a choice because if I leave, then what does that mean about me? Right? Like it wasn't about my happiness. It was about what will people think about me if I leave this, right? Or make this decision. And that'll mean I'm this loser again, who never gets anything. You know what I mean? I kept case building against myself over and over again. So anyways, left the job. We can stay in things that are unhealthy way too long because of that exact reason. We feel stuck. We feel like, what are people going to think? I'm supposed to be grateful for what I have. I shouldn't Mm -hmm. be risking it. I need to be responsible. We have all these shoulds and we end up staying in a job and relationship and situation that's not healthy, literally making us sick on the inside because we feel like it's the wrong thing to do. And I think we're waking up now to the real universal truth that we deserve 
to be happy. We deserve to be healthy. We deserve to feel good. We deserve to go after our dreams. We deserve to take up space in the world, but it's taking this like deconditioning and reprogramming and like shedding of all these old rules to even give ourselves permission to exist in that way. Girl. So how did you overcome that? Like, what was the conditioning that you had to drop in order to make that move and leave the shitty job? And then also, how did you end up then owning a gym? (laughs) So, yeah, I love that. I mean, for me, when it got into my health and the feeling was so uncomfortable, I'm kind of like, I'm really switching this now. And this is what I'm dedicated to. But I'm the kind of person who really, I had to get put back into a corner. It wasn't like, I love and respect myself, so I'm going to make an empowered decision. I was like, the universe is like, okay, I'm going to flick you. Hey, yo. And I was like, don't hear you. And then it was like, smack. And then I'm like, no, no, no. And it's like, all right, all right, I've got to crank up the volume. Two by four, whack. And I'm like, oh, that hurt, but I'm still good. Like, I can take a lot of pain. I'm, I'm good. And then it was just like, you know what I mean? The universe is like, yeah. you. like If you're not getting the picture, we're going to give you cancer. That's what, like, people don't want to... Do people don't like that answer when they're like, so how do I know what my soul's calling is? I'm like, most people get their ass kicked by the universe. They have a holy fuck moment or what I call a midlife awakening. And you get on the right path because you didn't have a choice, honey. And the ground comes out from underneath you. You lost the job. You lost the relationship. You get sick. Something traumatic happens that breaks you down to the studs. So you can build a new and authentically and get on the path that you're supposed to be on. And it's not pretty. It's hard as shit. And yet it's like, these are like, to me, when I look back, the juiciest moments, they're the holy fuck moments, right? That change the trajectory of our lives. And yeah, that's not the sexy answer of how you find your soul's purpose, but it's how it works, honey. None of us are getting out of this shit unscathed. Most of us don't wake up one morning and have a brilliant idea of our soul's purpose. It's like the two by four hits us and we're like, oh, I care about people and I want to be a counselor because this major trauma just happened. You know, like it's messy like that usually. Okay, so you leave the job. Oh, wait, hold on. The programming was you're just like you backed yourself into a corner and you had no other choice but to make a change and to put yourself, your health and well-being first because you were unwell. Basically, yeah. And I also loved and I also realized the difference of how I felt walking to my job and the, the energy that I was walking in and the energy I felt when I taught, even though it made no sense, even though I was taking a massive pay cut to go to that thing. I just trust it. I'm like, if I love this so much, if this shit's actually true, then maybe I can do make something out of this. So I ended up moving up and I ended up teaching like full time and worked into a manager position. And then one day my partner was like, would you ever want to open your own fitness studio? And I was like, are you fucking out of your mind? I know nothing about business. Like I didn't take a business course. Again, it was another like, I don't know anything about this. Da, 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 da. And then I saw this. My mom's like, I think you should go see this intuitive coach. And I was like, intuitive coach, <laughs> whatever. Like yeah. totally like, yeah, whatever, mom. Yeah. And then I went and saw her and she was like, yeah, so you're a natural entrepreneur. And I like, I wanted to smack her. I was like, I'm a natural entrepreneur. Like, is this some kind of <laughs> What does that joke? even mean? <laughs> what does that even mean? Entrepreneur and me were like the polar opposite. I was like, yeah, okay. But you know when somebody says something and there's like an energetic seed has been planted, like you can't fucking out see that thing. So between she said that and then my partner was like, would you ever open your business? And I was like, no. Anyways, the seed was planted. Within like days, I started getting like down, like things. Okay, so sorry. Let me just pause for a second. Before this, I was still working in the fitness studio. This is when I had my holy fuck moment. This is why I started the podcast because in 20, I was, compl- what I'll call it, I was in the fog. I was in the fog of conditioning of what life should be like. There was no intuitive sense. There was no like, I'm being led. It was just like, I'm alone. Things are fucking hard. Life kind of sucks. I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm resentful. And my partner was using, so he was struggled with addiction. And so he was using drugs and it was just really hard. Obviously anyone who's dated or has people in their family with addiction is fucking hard. So I was like struggling as a newly married woman supposed to have like supposed should be having the, you know, the best time of my life. And yeah, exactly. So three months after we went on our honeymoon, he went to rehab. So it was Christmas. He went over Christmas. He left right before Christmas on our first. And like, I'm bumping into people and they're like, Hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you since the wedding. Are you so happy? And I'm like, yeah, it's so great. Like, 
I was so embarrassed. I didn't know how to, do you know what I mean? Like I had no, and it was just the the false, like the fakeness. And I, I didn't know what to say. I had no, no coping skill. You know what I mean? I was just in fight or flight and, you know, didn't realize at the time. So anyways, I went, he went to rehab for like three months. During that time, I, they were like, okay, partners and families of addicts, you're going to go to this. It's like a week long intensive. And I'm the bitterness as I took the ferry over to the island. I was like, in the Vancouver Island, I was like, the whole time you should have seen me arms crossed. I was just like, this is bullshit. I want to go to Cancun. I don't want to be a fucking Nanaimo. This sucks. Nah, nah, nah. So super angry. I got over there. So standoffish. And we, we all sat together. Not there was like, this is separate. This is like families and partners of addicts. So we're sitting there and they say, they're like, okay, everybody. So today we're going to talk about you. And I broke. You had some resistance. I raised my hand and I was like, oh, excuse me. And the lady's like, uh huh. And I was like, oh, sorry. I think we have. I think you're misunderstood. I was like, I actually don't have prob the problem. And she looks at me. My partner has the problem. <laughs> yeah, I said I don't actually have the problem. My partner does. And she goes, she comes over to me and she's like, oh, sweetheart, you have the problem. And I was like, oh. I'm sorry. She goes, she goes, you're codependent. And I was like, I'm so code what? Like I had never heard of this term. Anyways. It was this massive eye-opening awakening to see that like it wasn't just him. It was like this co-creation of like who I was and who he was and how I energetically attracted that. Do you know what I mean? Like how that was a perfect match for me and how. So three days into this thing, I have this insane spiritual. This was my very first holy fuck moment. This is what changed everything for me. Like you've just said so beautifully. It's like that moment in your life where you can't go back. There is no, you can't unsee behind, you can't unsee behind the curtain. So I didn't believe in God. I had no type of religious background or spiritual like connection. And so this one morning I was like, just starting to like sob. Cause I think I was starting to, it was hitting me that like he'd been unfaithful. There's all sorts of stuff. And I just had this, like, it was like the only thing I can describe as like God energy. It like, it went through my hand, it went through my whole entire body. And there was this like insane, I was like half asleep, half awake. And he like handed me this flower and I'm pretty sure it was like Jesus. And anyways, it was like insane from that moment on it was like something just cracked and it was just like it completely I came back from that thing and I felt like a deer in the wild I felt like I had no like I just everything naked, changed like naked I, and afraid naked and afraid I had no idea I just was like oh my god it cracked like, you wide open to like wide open and realizing what, I had no it cracked you wide open to what like how would you describe that it was like I saw myself, there was this piece of self-responsibility that I'd never seen. It was awakening to the fact that, you know, why was I attracted to these people? Like why, you know, if I looked at my history, all the men I dated, like my first fiance was a gambling addict, right? Like super high intense men. And then I had like a rageaholic and then like a guy who was addicted to wheat. Like it was all men with very you know what I mean like it was yeah, they all had these yeah. big Compulsive chaotic things behaviors big chaotic. behaviors and why yeah, do so, you think that you were attracted to that now that you know what you know why yeah. do you think that you were attracted to men with big chaotic compulsive behaviors I think honestly it was a way for me to stay very distracted and away from my own pain looking mm -hmm. at myself because when you're mm -hmm. dating somebody who has very large personality you know what I mean or there's a lot of chaos or compulsion it creates a lot of chaos where you're sort of and also I think with my nervous system I was so used to I think I was used to chaos it was like my frequency chaos was my frequency overwhelm betrayal like all these I was so used to that low self-worth and so familiar, I was dating so it was safe familiar exactly familiar. absolutely I also familiar. feel like when you were saying you felt really lost when people feel really lost sometimes we can find ourselves attracted to people that have these big like identities because that's like certain right like I'm with someone who has narcissism or has an addiction or whatever it's like I'm lost but I'm grounded in that thing that's so blaring and truthful and big and also maybe I can find some purpose in helping and healing and being codependent and let's talk about codependency too like what did you learn for those that are listening who like that's one of those like I feel like kind of what's people don't really understand what it is you know what I mean until you're in it and you get out of it and then you realize what did you learn about codependency and how were you codependent Oh my gosh. Well, it was codependency is like 
the way I see it is like, it's like, I was like a meshing into the men. Like you just said so perfectly, they have big personalities. So it felt safe and grounding for me. It's like, I could just like chameleon into them. I see codependency. It's like, I need them to be okay, to be a certain way so that I can be okay. It's like not really having a sense of identity myself. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm dependent on them to like get feelings from joy from like have activities. Like I remember one boyfriend said to me, he's like, I'm, I remember he like cheated on me, I think. And then I found like a con used condom in the garbage or something. And I said to him, I was like, called him out on it. And he's like, well, you're like, so like boring. You don't even know what you like. Like who, like, Oh, wait, yeah. who said this to you? It was one of my exes. Oh yeah. He was like one of your was, exes. Like, so not your no, current. No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry. This was like a, he was, this guy was next level dick. Anyways, he was just like so mean and so rude. And he was like, I don't even know what you like. Like all you do is say yes to everything. Like, do you even have a person? Do you know what I mean? Like, but, wow. and even though it was horrible, there was truth. That, do you know what I mean? Like there was, mm. you know, when something stings really deep because you're like, there is, you know what I mean? Like, There's like a shred of truth to it. Now it's not okay to talk to anybody like that. However, there was a part of you that knew that was true. Absolutely. Which sucked even more. Cause you know, you're like, why does that hurt so much? Yes. He's being an absolute fucking dick. And there's truth to that, right? And so I, I feel like lost and I don't know who I am and I am a chameleon. Totally, right? I needed that. And at the time, there was only like people recommending Melody Beattie and she was sort of like the queen of codependency and self, you know, understanding like I had no self-care practices. I really didn't know who I was and I sort of latched on to people and relationships in order to find safety and also in order to like feel like a sense of identity or like I was going somewhere. So it was very dependent on who I was with and how they were really dictated how I felt so it was this very mm -hmm. you know and it showed up in business it showed up in life it showed up everywhere right? it was incestuous so it's just everywhere I went so there was this massive healing of like really starting to come into contact with Christine like who am I right and that was scary at you know late 20s early 30s it was like terrifying because I'm like oh my god right like well, okay, I've got to rediscover who I am and learn what self care is and not constantly be jumping to every single thing he needs. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was sort of, it was the him show. It wasn't anything about me. It was like, how can I help you feel better? And I think I just found so much, like you said, sense of purpose. So my purpose wasn't me empowering me and finding out who I was and what my soul and my mission is here on this planet. It was like, how do I help sort of maintain mm -hmm. and try to calm these super chaotic people in my life. And that gave me a sense of purpose because I feel like I was always here to be like a healer and a coach and that, but it was like, it was coming out in a way that was really toxic and unhealthy because I wasn't channeling that into my actual mm -hmm. sense of self purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Codependency is where we find our identity in taking care of someone else or something else. And the key phrase I love to share with people when they're like, it's like a blurred line. I can't tell if I'm struggling with codependency. If you have the thought or the feeling I'm okay, if they're okay, and I'm not okay when they're not okay outside of parenting, because that's a whole different, that needs like a specialized conversation around codependency. But like with partners, if they're okay, I'm okay. And if they're not okay, I'm not okay you're probably in the mess of codependency. And if your main role is to be a caregiver or to make sure people are okay, there's probably some codependency at play there. And like she, like Christine mentioned, the book Codependent No More is a really solid resource by the Melody. What's her name? Melody B. Melody B. Right? Melody B. Yeah. Melody yeah. B yeah. Or just yeah. following her work. She has a lot more to say about this. If you think you might listen, if you're with, someone who's suffering with addiction or substance use, you are probably in a codependent triangle, right? You're probably spending a lot of energy maintaining whatever normalcy in that addiction, safety in that addiction, help for your partner. And so it's really, it's almost like insidious because you don't see that you're in it because it's not as obvious as mm -hmm. the addiction but it's part of that formula and part of that equation. So you going, okay, hold on. So you going to the treatment for you, for your partner who was addicted and you realizing that you had been codependent and you'd been lost and you'd been pouring yourself into saving these men. Yeah. That was your first holy fuck moment of, 
I need to figure out who I am and I need to start to heal whatever is causing me this pattern of being with these people. Hold it. So how did that affect your marriage? You're only three months in, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, he came back out. Did you know that he had the addiction before you got married or was that like a bait and switch or Rooney's? No, I think I did. I mean, him and I, in total transparency, him and I used, like, I was never really into drugs that much or even alcohol, but like, I think that because he was in the restaurant scene and I really, again, loved the excitement of that and felt cool in that and whatever, like, you know, him and I even did drugs. Like we did drugs on our honeymoon. It was like, again, not insane, but we, you know, in full transparency. We partook. Yeah. And it, it was like fun. And then it turned off. Do you know what I mean? It was one of those things that it, it was fun until I realized that this is like, oh, I'm doing this by myself or I'm doing this with people with, that's not you type of thing. And so that's when, and I think I did know before what did I want to admit it? Was I in denial? I think so. I think so. Yeah. I would say that I was in denial and it was like, we were already engaged and I was like, this is not, I'm controlling this. This is mm-hmm. not changing. Mm-hmm. I'm in this. I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? It was like, I wasn't willing to stop and say, okay, we need to really discuss this and unpack this before we need to see what this looks like before we get married. I was just like, we're getting married and that's what's happening. Like super controlling behavior. You know what I mean? Like I, I just, yeah. yeah. So I got this, right? Well, I got this. I got yes. this under control. Totally. And so we, anyways, it did affect our marriage for sure. I mean, we, he came out and he did start using it again. I mean, it was just, I mean, we're just getting, we're just in the process in the summer of like in the middle of a divorce right now. But I mean, again, we're so good co-parents right now. And I've done so much work that I feel like, you know, we were, it was a 10, I mean, it was insane. But during that 10 years of a relationship, I mean, the amount of holy fuck moments, the amount of growth, the amount of like, you know what I mean? I feel like I can actually look back on that. I mean, it was, you know, when we, he first got out of rehab, it was really hard, but he was the one who catalyzed me to start the studio, right? Like it's this interesting, Absolutely. you know, where I was just like, he started, you know, I, so I started the studio within, I started getting after that spirit, holy, first holy fuck moment, I had the spiritual awakening. I'll call it that. I was getting up at, I was getting woken up at three in the morning and like the mission statement would drop in the name of the studio. I was getting visuals. I was getting like, it was like the channel had opened up and it was just like, boom, 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 boom. And that kind of freaked me out at first. Like it was kind of a scary thing. So I was like, what the fuck is all this shit? But it was so, because I was such a non-believer, the shit that was happening, I'm like, I can't fucking deny this. Like this is for realsies. Like this is actually happening. I'm getting information that's not even coming from my own mind. And where is it coming from? It feels spiritual. Feels spiritual. Exactly. And so it was like, it started happening. I had a business partner at the time we were like, you know, kind of all going all in. We opened up a location in North Vancouver and I was like so excited. It was just like, boom, 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 boom. But then we opened the business and the business partner had a sort of not a great experience before in a previous business partnership. And so I think that came out. There was stuff I think going on with her partner at the time. He wasn't super supportive. I was still had chaos with Kevin. Like it was one of these like perfect storms where like shit was brewing. So we opened the fitness studio Kevin and I were still not fully on the, like, in the best spot. I ended up getting pregnant a month after we opened the fitness studio. So we literally opened the fitness studio. I get pregnant unexpectedly a month after. Mm -hmm. My business partner slowly starts to, like, leave, which freaks me out, which draws me more into control. So she exits the partnership. I am now alone, like, running a business studio that I have no idea how to run. I've got a partner who's using. I'm pregnant. And I was on EI, government assistance. So at that time, I was living on government assistance because I couldn't work. You know, I'm building a fitness studio like I was. Anyways, I had left my old job. Mm -hmm. So I'm on government assistance. I'm living in a studio rental apartment. I'm not even living with my partner this time. Like, I'm alone, pregnant, no idea. I have, like, 20 employees. I have, like, I was, like, in the shit storm. Wow. Complete stress overload. Like I was, it was insane. My daughter ended up coming six weeks early. Mm. So my partner and I moved back in together like a couple months before I gave birth. She came six weeks early. Mm. So it was like, we were in the NICU. I was Mm. so stressed out. I had never been a mom. I was totally dysregulated. Like, because it had gone from like, this is amazing. This like, this amazing spiritual experience. And I'm going to create this gym because I really want to help people because I struggled with fitness. I struggled with finding something that I loved. And when I found TRX and I found this workout, I loved it so much that it made me want to work out from a different place. And so I was like, I want to help people, inspire people, understand they're worthy of fitness, that they're worthy of their, like coming from a place of worthiness, not punishment. So I had this really beautiful, pure intention, but it was like, 
life was also fucking nuts. And I also, what I realize now is when that spiritual awakening happened, I really dove into the spiritual world, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But I would say I was doing a lot of spiritual bypassing. Like it was a lot of like, oh, everything happens for a reason, yada, yada. But I hadn't done any of the human work. I hadn't addressed my nervous system. I hadn't addressed the trauma. The trauma. I hadn't addressed. I was frozen, like in emotional, like I was like completely clogged. And I was just like drowning with like all the, the stress and, and stuff. So yeah. anyways, that was a bit of a ride. Were you and your daughter okay with her coming six weeks early? That's so hard. Yeah, she was. But I mean, I was in the NICU. My breast milk didn't come in. I was so stressed out. And I was like trying to pump in the NICU. I'm like taking phone calls because like we couldn't afford a studio manager. Like I was fully working on my laptop and trying to figure out what the fuck was going on. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, have to leave my baby there and come back. And I'm like bringing my laptop. And again, like I said, like I'm having to like fire somebody over the phone. He's being a dick. It was just like, when I look back on that version, the, the love that I have for that, oh yeah, it was just, it was crazy. So anyways, she was okay. She was super like, she was strong and like, she's a little she fighter. Was so she, yeah, she's a little fighter. So she came back, but I just realized that first few years was really tough. I felt like I was not, I couldn't breastfeed. So I did lose like a, it, that, you know, I was definitely hard on myself for that. Like I felt like, oh, it's my fault and why can't mm-hmm. I and all these things. And I just wasn't super present for her. Like I do, I'm doing a lot of like work around that now around presence with my children and how can I do that? Cause it's a big value of mine. And, but during that time I look back and I was so dysregulated. I didn't have, I couldn't be present with her. I couldn't be present with myself. Like it was, I would kind of pop her over there so I could try to work and You know, my partner didn't have a lot of money at the time. So we were super struggling with that. So it's just like kind of this perfect storm of sort of chaos. And then a year about when she was about a year and a half, I I think it was 2018. This is kind of leads into my, how I got into coaching. But in 2018, I hit another like insane. I started the year with pneumonia an ear infection that turned into an ear infection. I went on a retreat for the first time and that was like a big thing for me. Like I was like, how do I justify a thousand dollars when we have no money and blah, blah. And I have this young baby, but something inside of me told me to go. And I had like some big awakenings when I went to that retreat. So I love retreats. I actually run them now as well. But I went there and I was like, oh, I'm like not like I was, I realized I was not okay. So I had like all these crazy symptoms. All my health started declining. Pneumonia turned into adrenal fatigue so I actually got to the point where I couldn't I was like running off coffee adrenaline stress hormones cortisol like was pumping I had this young baby the studio wasn't making its bills like it was just insane like you know and we're not talking like five grand a month like the outgoings are like 25,000 a month like it's no joke right and so my partner and I were having to put our own money in the gym it was just like so stressful I ended up getting super super sick I had adrenal fatigue I got to the point where I started having like panic attacks I couldn't drive So I could barely take care of my baby. I was like crazy panic attacks, super stressed, like crazy anxiety. There was times I was like, I need to go, I need to drive myself to the hospital. Like I I couldn't, like I just was so dysregulated and I kept pushing. Like, do you know what I mean? It was just like, I wasn't stopping. I got shingles in the summer. I was like, I'm fucking 30 something. Who gets shingles? You know what I mean? Like, so I got shingles. The universe was like, okay. Your body was trying to tell you again, like, stop, lady, stop. stop. Do you know what the stop is? It was dead of summer and I was like feeling a little tiny bit better. And I went to go work and meet up with a coworker and I'm sitting there working and there's no clouds. There's no wind. There's no nothing. And all of a sudden I just hear this like crack and I'm like, what the fuck? And we're sitting below a tree. I get up to get out of like the picnic table. I can't make it out. The tree smacks like this tree branch smacks me down to the ground on my back. What? Yes. And I'm like, I said, I'm like, I think I'm going to die. Like I had kind of came to that term. I'm like, I think I might just die. Like I might die. Cause the, you know, and then I realized anyways, I went to this retreat. I had this download. I was sitting there and all I heard was you're going to run a retreat here. And I was like, I'm going to run a retreat. I don't know how to run a retreat. I can't even fucking function right now. What the fuck is happening right now? And it was like, you're going to run a retreat. And you're like, I'm getting taken out by trees. I'm getting trees. I got shingles. I'm like a nine year old woman. What do you mean? So you kept getting this like divine in like messaging around what you should be doing with your soul's purpose. But it was always like a step before you knew how to do it, what to do, do all of it. And that is so scary because it's like, great, I have this information, but I don't know how to do that. And it takes a lot of courage to then figure it out. 
right? A hundred percent. And I also heard, I was working with this intuitive coach and she said, she's like, I'm doing a year long coaching program. You should join. And I was like, I don't have like 20 grand. Like, how am I going to fucking, you know what I mean? Like, how am I going to figure anyways? It just was like another thing. And I kept getting this feeling like, you got to do this program. You got to do this program. And so I figured it out. I ended up like, anytime I've done that, it's like crazy, but it's like the money's come. I did a mentorship with Rebecca Campbell, same thing. Like, it's like, I've made the decision, even though it seemed like it was not, it was like, I don't have any way to pay for this. It's like the decision was made and the fucking money come, like it was wild. So that's my experience too. Isn't it wild? Like, it sounds like a marketing tactic, like just pay for it and you'll be fine. But like, I've had that experience the money so comes. many times, the money comes. And so I paid monthly installments and anyways, about, you know, what's interesting. So I decided, I was like, I'm going to run my first retreat. I had no idea how to do it. I had no fucking idea. I was just like, I'm just going to book the place. It ended up selling out and your retreat, I ended up first retreat ended up selling out and it was like 11 women and a lot of them were from the studio. And then when I was there, this lady was like, Oh my gosh, you're like super spiritual. Like it's so crazy. I would have had no idea. And so I realized how much I was living one life Mm. diving into spirituality, one life being this like I'm a gym owner, right? It was very, yeah, it was very different. And then as I started running retreats and as I stepped into the coaching program, all of my physical symptoms started going away. Uh, So it was like the panic attack stocks was another thing. Panic attacks went away too? Everything. See, this is like, I always say there's like three causes of anxiety and one is you're not on the right track. Mm -hmm. That's just one. That's not the only So you don't have to assume the worst right now, Mm -hmm. listeners, but there's like an incongruence inside and that creates this like energy in the body of like, we're not on the right track. We're not doing the right thing. This isn't for me. And it ends up becoming panic attacks and freaking shingles. Like, hello, if that's not a message that we're not in the right spot, if we're growing shingles, But we don't listen to our bodies because so many of us women have been hating on our bodies and punishing our bodies and disconnected. So when our body is telling us you're not in the right thing, we just ignore it because we've never really respected what our body had to say. I have to sneeze. (coughs) Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. So you're freaking selling out retreats. I want to hear more about your retreats, but we can talk about that later because I love me a good retreat, honey. So you're running the gym, you're hosting retreats, you're becoming a coach, your physical symptoms are improving because you're starting to also you're strengthening your spiritual connection and you're getting downloads and all of this. And so where does it go from there? And how do you get to the decision to sell Because I know you recently sold the gym, right? Yeah. And started going through a divorce with your partner. So let's get to that point in your story. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So yeah. So anyways, started running retreats, started coaching. And then like halfway through the program, I just started like, I would realize I'm like, I've been coaching my whole fucking life. My coaching, like, yes, I'm taking the certification, but my coaching is my fucking life and what I've been through. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I, and I realized I'm like, I'm attracted to people who are intuitive. I'm attracted to people, you know, who have that, that vibe. So I started coaching that was leading me down a path. I was loving it, but it was a very part-time thing. Okay. We hit 2020 COVID hits. My relationship was kind of declining. He started using again right before COVID and something happened. And I ended up just like, I was like, I drew a line in the sand and I was like, called it. And I was like, your final straw. Yeah. Well, I thought it was my final final straw. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. It's a journey. Did he have bouts of sobriety in your relationship? Yes. Yes. Okay. So he would be using. Yeah. So there was like, there was a two and a half year. I think there was like a two year gap where I'm using. Where he was clean. Wow. Yes. But there was still addictive tendencies, if you will. Do you know what I mean? Like there were still behaviors, but it wasn't coming out in the addiction. Yes. So he started, he used again. I called it. I went to Sedona for like a week by myself. I got back. I started hearing about this whole COVID thing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Why are these freaks getting all toilet paper? Got back, literally found out the gym was closing. And I was like losing my fucking mind. Because right before that, we'd finally hit momentum. We were making money in the business. Things were like classes were selling out. I was like, hallelujah, finally, five years. This is it. We're doing this. And I was like, we're making money. I'm paying myself a salary. This is incredible. Yes. yes. Shut down. And you know, Jim's got hit hard. So it was a two year journey. I left my partner, we were co-parenting, COVID happened, Jim shut down. I totally, so it was this like blessing and curse. It was like, I like melted down. And one of this girl, the gym was like, it's okay. I'll help you. I'll support you. So she helped me like go up virtual and everything. 
So because that was so quiet, it allowed me to step into my coaching business. And I started diving into like taking courses and taking masterminds and working with people and challenging myself on money beliefs and all sorts of stuff. Because my greatest fear of leaving my partner was I can't survive on my own. How am I going to pay for myself? Like I was so much coding and lineage, right? Mom and her mom and just like this sort of like lack and scarcity and all the, and just like and there the was codependence, literally, right? The codependence. And the codependence. Like who am I by I myself? I and- about this person. Yes. And can I support myself? Like there was that big code in there around, can I support myself? Can I actually do this? And I was terrified to leave the marriage. So I I went down and that's when I dove into like inner child work, shadow work. I mean, I sat with myself and I called it, I call it defrosting. Like I was defrosting everything and it was a chaotic and I was messy and I was screaming and I finally learned how to access and embody my like sacred rage and my no and my boundaries. And I was like screaming into pillows and fucking, I was like, going eight ship, but it was so liberating. I was healing and I was liberating and I was like, finally was ready to look at money and look at all these things. And so I dove deep, I invested in myself. I started investing in programs and that was scary. And then I started going even bigger. And anyways, my coaching business like blew up. I had like a multi six figure like year when the business shut down and I was like, holy fucking wow. shit balls. Like I can make money. Like I can, and I, I wasn't even serving that many people. It's just like, it was just wild. Like What were you coaching women on? Were they, were you coaching them on transformation, career changes, divorces? What were people coming to you for? Yeah. So one-on-one was sort of a smorgasbord. It was kind of like a mix of like people, you know, they're like, you're psychic. Can you, should I leave my husband? And I was like, well, it's not really that easy. I'm like, because if you leave him and you don't change, you're going to attract 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 another one just like him. Exactly. Same type of man, maybe different. So things, like, was it intuitive days, life coaching? Basically people were coming. To it was like intuitive. Yeah. Life coaching. Yeah. So it was one-to-one was intuitive life coaching. It was like sort of a mix and business as well. Like I found I was working with kind of a mix of people. And then I started running like 10 to 12 people, 15 people can like group experiences, containers type of things. So I started, I was in the forest one day during COVID and I just heard, you're going to run this six month container. It's going to look like this. You want about eight women it's going to be, you're going to offer them like one-on-one coaching plus all transformational, like inner child. You're going to take them through you, what you've just embodied, what you've just learned, what has just had you heal and to massively go from like surviving to thriving. Like mm-hmm. you're going to walk them through that. And so I had no, like, it was just like, boom, here's the module. Mo- like the whole thing was channeled and downloaded. And I was like, holy shit. Just came to you. Came to me. Program. So I did that. It was all about transformation and how to really transform and understanding that like people love diving into manifestation and stuff. I'm like, this actually is the foundation of manifestation because if you, healing. like, if you don't do the inner work, healing is manifest. It is. Yes. Right. And so I think yes. people were not, you know, understanding that. So people don't realize that when you heal, you raise your frequency. You can't bypass that step and just 100%. vision board your way. You have to do the inner work, baby. And that, to because I'm so passionate about manifesting, but through the vehicle of healing and integrating who you authentically are, because then you raise your frequency. And then you have the actual belief system that you deserve that higher vision for your life. And then you have the audacity to go out and take the action to make it happen. But if you don't do the healing, really quick though, was it the kind of, fallout in your relationship and the divorce or COVID that you think kickstarted your healing journey or something else? It was both. It was a combination. It was was being brought to my knees again. It was like the business closing and having to completely to surrender to not know what that was going to look like. It was surrendering to the relationship. So during that time, him and I both did a ton of work. I really realized again about the self-righteous part of me, the one who wanted to punish the one, like I realized I did a ton of shadow work. Like I really understood where my co-creation was and how I was a very equal and how I loved seeking out men who were with who I knew would fuck up this is a big realization I'm like oh I'm attracted to men it was like one day just smacked me in the face I was like oh I'm like attracted to men who fuck up because it gives me a very temporary surge of power I don't believe I'm powerful and so when I'm surround myself with people who are like I kind of know we're gonna fuck up it gives me this, like, I'm good, you're bad. Like, it, do you know what I mean? It was like this yeah, really oh, yeah. sneaky. Like, comparatively, sneaky. I'm great over here. I'm just thriving. Totally. I'm great. And you're bad. And you should yeah. be shamed. Like, and it was just, again, it came from such a dark place. Anyways, did a ton of stuff around that. Started helping women. And I worked with men as well, interestingly enough. And I, anyways, I love, it was, so I was doing one-to-one group stuff. Um, and then we ended up getting, him and I ended up getting back together. After about a year, it was just like, 
you know, we started going on dates again and stuff like that. We ended up, you know, I was like, okay, this, he feels very different. This feels different. And so we got back together. I ended up getting pregnant the first time we had sex. Oh, I knew that there was another soul who wanted to come in. I knew it. I felt it. And I have no regrets about it. We got back together. I got pregnant. The relationship didn't really have time to foster because I got, you know, I mean, it was just sort of like, again, game time again, baby. Yeah. The studio opened back up again. So then I found myself split between the studio and the coaching business. And I loved the coaching business. And it made me realize how much I had disconnected my passion from the fitness studio, but I felt trapped again. I didn't know how to get, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. And then find you know, we had to rebuild from COVID and I found myself just like really disconnected in it. And so anyways, it was a journey, but I had Mia and I don't regret that for a second, but our relationship really started declining sort of like right before I had her. And so I knew that it was not the best, you know what I mean? I just kind of knew that it was, I think I knew that it wasn't going to work out, but I just couldn't bear to imagine that because we just, you know, again, a second baby, it should be joyful and it's not, you know what I mean? Like it should be all these things. And I did, def- it was joyful to have her, but it was just not having a partner who was, who could be there for me. And you know what I mean? There's definitely a, a lot of grief I had to work through with that. And it not going to like the moms on Instagram and like, look at my little perfect baby. And we match. I was like, oh, I have a business that I'm not in love with. I want to do this business. I feel trapped. My partner's using this is chaos. And like, I have two kids. Do you know what I mean? It was, and I'm still working. I have no mat leave. So it was just like a lot of, again, another, I went through another sort of dark journey. I started like not making as much money anymore in my business. It was like almost like all of the mirroring of what happened before. And so it was anyways, over time, in this last year, I mean, this last summer, I call this the summer of transition to sort of takes us to where we are now. But I knew that I wanted to step into the podcast and I want to write a book called Holy Fuck, I'm in Recovery, a former codependence journey from rock bottom to living large. So I channeled 20,000 words already back in 2017. I know my mission and I know what I want to do here. But it was so scary because it was like, but if I sell this business, I still make a small salary, you know, I make a salary, I put my card, like all these things that were these little perks. And I was like, how do I lose it, all my salary? You know what I mean? Like the salary from that and the comfort of that. But I know that I have to free up my energy. Like it was this, like it was constantly back and forth and back and forth. And same thing with the relationship until it got the universe started squeezing me again. And I was like, okay, fine. Okay. Fuck, 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 fuck. And then I was just like, okay, I want to sell the business. And so I started just putting it out there. Um, my partner started using again, so he moved out. And so it was, it's been really crazy, but I feel so in my power I've never felt so powerful I've like I've stepped into the podcast I'm like I think one of the most beautiful things that we can do is in a regular like you know if and obviously not more like active in a trauma response but is starting to step like the things I'm doing right now are really questioning who I think I am and stepping into my fears like if I'm afraid of doing taxes or if I'm afraid of this part of my life when I keep it in the shadows and I keep it as that like shameful thing that I'm like kind of scared of, I'm like really boldly stepping towards it and saying, I don't know exactly how to do this. I don't know exactly what this looks like. Can somebody help me or can I learn this so that I'm not, do you know what I mean? Like I feel like I'm just starting to step towards the discomfort now more than ever starting to do things. I'm starting to question myself. I started like cold showering when I was the woman who's like, get me away from any cold water. I just want to be in a hot tub. Like I've started doing things that are radically different. And through that, there's a whole new, Chris, like this is blossoming of this like new emergence of me. It's like this summer, like you said, I wrote a post recently. I'm like, I was brought down to the studs. It's like my, you know, sixth iteration of Christine, but I'm realizing this is like for realsies. Like I cleared the decks this summer. I was like, I'm getting a divorce and like, you know, I'm in it. We're no, the not going back. I sold the business and I'm stepping into this podcast and this coaching business full, like fully. And I don't know what that looks like. So there was so much, again, but I have so many tools now, how to regulate myself, how to navigate that, how to be so comfortable not knowing any pieces are fully anchored, but there's this like complete calm within the storm, which I think really is a superpower. Cause I'm like, if I can do this right now and I can walk towards it, like there's no real fear. Like, you know what I mean? I know I can tell when I'm in imposter syndrome. I can tell when I'm in fear of rejection. I can tell when I'm in these states, these states that can hold us back. Yeah. And I feel really clear. So I, I love walking with really powerful, again, you know, women and men who are, who are in that state of just like, I want, I'm so ready. Like I want to step into purpose. I'm ready to go. And I think because I've done that work myself and walk through spirituality and walk through the like inner work, I feel like I can really support people in a true way where I'm not, you know, there's no faking it. There's no like, you know, and so mm-hmm. it feels fun. It feels fucking yeah. exciting. You know, like it feels good. 
Yeah, it's like such a beautiful journey to really reclaiming your power and your essence and your purpose. And I think the common denominator that I see in your story is this like resilience and tenacity to figure the shit out. And I hope that you know that about yourself, that like, whatever it is, I will figure it out. I always have. I always will. I don't need the answers. I don't need the rubric. I know I can rely on believing in myself that I will find a way. I didn't know how to, you know, run a gym. I figured it out. I didn't know how to be a mother. I figured it out. I didn't know how to be in codependency. I figured it out. I didn't know how to heal. I figured it out. I didn't know how to start a coaching business. I figured it out. You will fucking figure it out. And that is your power. And I think the thing I want to end with, because it's so beautiful in your story, is like finding your purpose isn't this like overnight, quick and easy thing. Mm -hmm. That whole journey, that whole beautiful journey you just shared that was really messy and really hard and the, you know, the getting your ass kicked by the universe and rediscovering parts of who you are and healing and peeling back the layers. All of that is what took you to your purpose. And that was a span of like 20 fucking years. So guys, (laughs) if you don't have it figured out yet, trust that you actually are already in process of figuring it out. It's not as simple as you know, read this book and you're going to find your purpose. It's follow your pain because somewhere in that pain is your purpose. It's look back at your story like Christine's and how did you navigate the messy? How did you find your way through? What is it about you that made you survive this shit? There's something to that. And I just think it's so cool that you just keep showing up for yourself in that way, reclaiming your power, saying yes to yourself, figuring it out as you go. And now you have this like big purpose in the world that is, trust me, just going to continue to open up and expand and thrive because you've allowed yourself to step into it. So cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. I do. And I also realized, well, like, I think a lot of us suffer from perfectionism. It's like, oh, well, I can't start that thing because I don't know how. And I remember it's like, we just need to be two steps. Like in my coaching business, I was like, I just can be two steps ahead or in this one area. Like I'm coaching women sometimes who are like multimillionaires and like, I don't even go and research like my client. I really want to keep it like clean and where I'm not, you know what I mean? Like oftentimes for I meet Whatever a client, they're presenting I, to you is what you're working with. You're not figuring out their stuff. You're letting totally. them come to you with what it is. And you're taking that for the present moment value. Yeah. That's important. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just being, and also just understand exactly like that. Yeah. I think purpose finds us. I think it's already, I have a belief that we already have like a blueprint inside of us and our purpose, our mission, what we're here for is encoded it's not something we have to go find it's in us i think it's actually around the deconditioning and the unlayering and through that process we find our purpose because i believe that all that stuff clutters and makes us confused and clutters it and fogs us out and so when we start working through some of that pain and questioning like who am i and what do i fucking care about what do i actually care about like what a, a prompt i go to a lot is like okay if I get to my deathbed and I'm, let's say, hopefully like late nineties and I'm like taking my last breaths and I'm reviewing my life, like what would be a really fuck, where would I look back and be like, I don't even want to change a fucking thing. Like what actually do I care about? Right? Like do, is the job, like would I be super thrilled if I get to my, you know, my deathbed and I look back and I'm like, I'm so glad I stayed in that mediocre job and relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm so happy. Wow. Wow. You know what I mean? Like when that, I can't remember the author, but that like six regrets of the dying or whatever it is. And it's like the number one regret from people was living a life, not for themselves, for somebody else. And so I think that's the thing is like, I'm like Brene Brown says, like I'm willing to go in the arena and I'm willing to get fucking beat. And I think that everything that I've been through, if I could kind of package it right now, like I'm emerging into this new chapter of my life where I want to help people with purpose. I want to help people, you know, rediscover who they are. And I couldn't do any of that. If I didn't, I couldn't write the book. I couldn't do the podcast. I couldn't talk about these super, like the Holy Fuck Moments podcast is all about the messy. It's like literally diving in. Like it's uncensored. I want people to go raw. I want people to understand they're not alone. I want to talk about the shit that nobody does because I've done a lot of like reconciling with that. So I'm not afraid to share my, like the messy sides because I'm good with it. I'm not afraid of somebody judging me because I'm like, I've already judged myself harder than anybody could. And I've been through that. So like, I'm good. So I think... Sometimes like, yeah, you're like you said, I have this, like, I love this theme, but it's like turning your mess into magic. It's like, how do you turn what you've been through your mess, your pain? And how do you help people? How do you be of service? How do you because there's nobody better than you who's embodied all that and moved through it to help somebody 
because it's not something you can learn in a textbook. It's not something you can, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a rite of passage. It's like, you have to walk through that in order to be, and you can feel it when somebody, when you meet somebody who's been through some shit and has come out the other side, I mean, there's an energetic signature there. That's like, boom, it's like dynamite. It's like, whoop. Yes. <laughs> and I think that's when I met you. I was like, people. oh yeah, she's, yeah. yeah, she's my people. She's my fucking people. <laughs> but anyway, I'll stop there. Yes. Well, girl, thank you so much for keeping it real and coming on here and sharing your story and the vulnerable and messy tidbits. And I'm just so excited to be in your court and see where you go and all the amazing things that you do and the way that you help people through their transformation. So yeah, I'm excited to see kind of where our friendship goes from here too. But thank you for coming on today and sharing. I know that mamas out there are going to be really inspired by your story and find a part of themselves in your story so they don't feel alone. So mm -hmm. thank you, lady. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to, if anyone wants to connect, Yes. Where can they find you? I'm just Christine Bano uh, on Instagram. So it's just at Christine Bano, B-A-N-N-O and C-H-R-S-T-I-N-E. ChristineBano.com. It's kind of a work in progress right now, but as I shift and evolve, but you can come on there on my website or you can find me on the Holy Fuck Moments podcast. It's on Apple, it's on Spotify, it's on all the major platforms. So you can come and connect me on there. I do mini riffs. So I like riff on shit that I'm moving through. Like the other day, I was like, felt like a bag of shit. And I was like, all right, everybody, here's 10 minutes. I feel like a shit and this is what I'm going to go do about it. So I like riff on my honest stuff that I'm moving through. And then I interview people on their holy fuck moments. So it's like a smorgasbord of like, holy fuck, I'm in perimenopause or holy fuck, I just overdosed the time. Like it's all sorts of stories. So it's really cool. Yeah. So if you're looking for some raw binge worthy content, it's definitely yes. No, it's good. You guys, I've listened to our podcast. It's great. And we will put all of those links in the show notes so you guys can connect with Yay. Christine. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Brooke. You're an amazing host. So thank you. Yes. All right, mamas. I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of your day. And we will be back same time, same place next week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Unperfected Pod. I hope this episode helped you feel a little less alone and a little more inspired to be you. If you like what we're doing here, I would so appreciate that you subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. If you do, share the episode on Instagram and tag me at Brooke Jean Unperfected to enter to win a one-to-one -one laser coaching session. Also, feel free to join me in my private Facebook community, Mommy's Mental Health Matters, where we continue the conversation. Thanks again for being here and see you in next week's episode.